Well, hello there. Welcome everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to Roadmap to Recovery, the second in a series of forums for hospitality presented by the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival. My name is Anthea lucas Bosha. I'm the CEO of Food and Wine Victoria. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be moderating a conversation today on how to operate in the new normal as we renegotiate, sorry, as we negotiate the phased lifting of restrictions on trade in hospitality. A very big thank you to our partners at Bank of Melbourne and Visit Victoria for your ongoing support of the festival and in turn Victoria's hospitality sector. Well, it seems a little bit obvious to say, but what an impossibly tough time we've had. When lockdown hit, an estimated 441,000 Australian hospitality jobs vanished virtually overnight. With an, April, with an April IBIS World Report failure to launch, predicting a 25.1% decline in revenue for Australian restaurants in 2019 to 2020. That's a $5 billion wiped off the bottom line. And around the world, Intel is showing that revenue remains at about 50% of pre-COVID-19 income levels. For Victorian businesses, well indeed Australian businesses, there is a glimmer of hope as we discover what our new normal looks like. As of June 1, just last week, the phased reopening of venues commenced with venues allowed to accommodate up to 20 diners per enclosed dining space with density restrictions. And with the expectation that those numbers will increase to 50 diners on June 22, and possibly up to 100 diners by the second half of July. And it's probably fair to say that there's been some really strong positive indicators, even in just the last few days, that perhaps um, we are coming towards um, the close of lockdown or get, getting closer. And perhaps um, the end of lockdown may be perhaps even uh, quicker than we first thought. Now to help you with advice on how to approach the reopening period, we have convened a very, very special um, panel of guests today. And let me, please let me introduce you to them. Welcome to Mr. Wes Lambert, the CEO of Restaurant and Catering Association. Wes, thank you for being with us today and welcome. Thank you. A big thank you to Justin Hems, the CEO of Sydney's Maryvale Group, who's joining us from Sydney, where I believe it's rainy today, Justin. Is that right? It certainly thank is. <laughs> Thank you for being with us today, very busy man. And the fabulous Melbourne chef and restaurateur, Jerry Mai, uh, whose venues include Anam, Biho and Phonum. Jerry, thank you for joining us today. Um, it's, great to, it's great to see you all. And thank you all for joining us in the audience. We're very pleased that you've taken the time out of your busy schedules today to um, join us. We look forward to sharing this conversation with you and we'll run it as a group discussion, but we'll also be taking questions. So if you have any um, things you'd like to ask our panelists, please use the chat tab and we'll address them throughout the course of the session, but then we'll also um, pick up at the end of the session as well. So let's begin, shall we? Um, Wes, perhaps I can begin with you. Well, our audience should be very familiar with the guidelines. Perhaps it'd be a great place to kick off might be for you to clarify the key points on what restaurants need to do in Victoria to comply under the current restrictions. Right. So you can find these, uh, these guidelines uh, on the restaurant and catering website. Uh, and we have a coronavirus hub that lists the guidelines by state. Uh, and you can also find them at business.victoria.gov.au. And some of the things that are listed in the checklist uh, directly from the, uh, from the government website is ensuring the staff well-being, which is number one priority, uh, and that someone from the staff of the business has been offered training uh, in COVID safe operations. Uh, that's offered by the Victorian government and by restaurant and catering. Um, you have to have provisions in place, and I know this is restrictive, but you have to have provisions in place to record your patrons' details. Okay, you need at least a name and contact number, um, it's every person, not just uh, the head of household or the head of the table, it's every person. Now, we do expect and hope that that won't be forever, uh, but right now it is the most COVID safe way to track and trace uh, until the entire country has the 
federal COVID safe app. Uh, it's important to do your deep clean uh, at the end of every night uh, or as requested and required by your uh, by the state. Um, and the one that we all dislike the most is the patron numbers. So the capacity of 20 patrons per dining space, not including staff, that needs to be 1.5 meters away from each table at a density of one per four square meters. Now that seems very complicated, but basically if you're an 80 square meter dining area, you can have 20 people per, per dining area. So just think of the 80-20 rule. If I have 80, I can have 20. Uh, if you're larger than that, uh, that room can still only have 20 people. Uh, I did go into quite a few uh, Melbourne venues uh, last week, and there were quite a few that were much larger than 80 that just had the 20. Um, you need to have your signage out front, which uh, gives the patrons awareness, uh, as well as will let your council and the uh, state police know that you are following the requirements of the Victorian Health Department. Uh, so you have to have the checklists uh, displayed for public view. Now, those are the mandatory requirements. Now, the non-mandatory guidelines, you know, that's a 30-page document uh, that uh, is available um, on the government website and our hub. And that includes things like you know, hand sanitizers, social distancing in the waiting area, um, you know, what you do with, uh, with cutlery, crockery, uh, what you're doing with uh, entries and exits, those are all best practice. However, they're not mandatory, but we certainly want to make sure that businesses remain COVID safe. Mm. In your experience, thank you, Wes. Um, in your experience so far, talking to operators across the country, what, what have businesses found most difficult to comply with? Uh, you'd be quite surprised. They actually haven't found it hard to comply with the check, mm -hmm. with checking in. Uh, that's quite easy. Uh, most restaurants would have a front desk anyway. Justin can uh, second that motion. Most have a front desk anyway. Um, and so getting the name and telephone number very quickly. And I've been in the cafes that, that do it very greatly. They just come up to you at the table and make sure that they have all of your details. Um, and if you're going to the counter to order, you just give your name and phone number if you're going to sit down. So it, it can be smooth. Uh, there's also a couple of apps out there like uh, Guest HQ and Guest Check that um, mm -hmm. uh, that make it also seamless, so that you just basically mm -hmm. pick up your phone and say, "I checked in," and it's done, and no one you don't have to wow. give any information to anyone. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's the one where we thought it was going to be the hardest, but it turns out mm -hmm. it's the, really the biggest and most difficult is the capacity. Um, you know, there have there have been lots and lots of angry people, both patrons and businesses that say that different business types have, are being treated differently. Uh, we explain to them that it's behavior. You behave differently when you're walking through a Bunnings or a Coles or a Woolies or a retail store than you do when you are sitting in a restaurant or in a hotel. Uh, you behave differently. And so the health authorities treat them differently and that we have to understand that that's, that is just par for the course and that we're working very closely with the government to converge those behaviors as fast as possible to get businesses open more quickly. Um, but that that's, that is really the biggest complaint from businesses is they don't mm -hmm. understand the mm -hmm. one per four or why different states have been allowed different speed reopenings if it's a federal mm -hmm. pandemic. Right. Um, Jerry, I might throw to you for a moment. You've commenced reopening some of your businesses with phone on in Collins Street and Bayho in um, Glen Waverley Open. How have you found the implementation of the guidelines into your business, into your businesses? Um, it's been a little bit different for both, like uh, what Wes was saying, it's different implementations to different businesses. Like mm -hmm. Phonom is a, a QSR, so there's no table service because part of the restrictions is it, you have to have table service um, to be able to open for customers to sit down. Where Phonom, we don't have the, the space or the capacity to do so, so we're still at takeaway for that um, and then at Beer Ho, we've been able to manage the numbers and, and, and the spacing um, but getting the information was a bit difficult and a little bit um, 
uh, tedious, I think, in, in some aspects. Mm -hmm. um, but having two different businesses trying to make sure that they can open or do dining or sit in um, was something that we had to really work out. What we were, were we going to change one business to, to cater to, to um, um, table service so that we can sit down, or was it we kept our model and just uh, worked within the guidelines? Mm -hmm. So where's, where can people get clarification on what they need to do? They can contact you if they need to provide so we're the advice. Yep. So we're the single source of truth for the explanation. Mm -hmm. So if you want the actual rules, then you go to the Business mm -hmm. Victoria site and that's prescriptive. So it says mm -hmm. one, two, three, four, five. If you don't understand what that means uh, and you want to hear it in restaurant ease and restaurant language, uh, you can certainly give us a call or go to our coronavirus hub. We have basically wrote FAQs for all of the guidelines on our mm -hmm. coronavirus hub that's easier to, to understand about what's mandatory and what's not and what is the most COVID safe. Yeah, okay, thank you. And Justin, um, what's happening up in Sydney? Are the, the New South Wales guidelines dramatically different to what we're experiencing uh, down here? The, the restrictions and the regulations, uh, I mean, the same as what Wes has just gone through. Mm -hmm. um, the difference we have, and it's you know been very beneficial for us, is that we have a capacity of 50 people mm. uh, per room. So it's not per venue, it's per room. So if you have a, um, a multi-level um, facility, mm -hmm. um, and that, that facility can also be broken up into rooms, it's 50 per room. So mm -hmm. on a large scale venue, you're getting reasonable, reasonable numbers. Um, and that was, you know, we had a very strong um, um, launched this last week, um, um, overwhelming response from the guests um, and from staff. I mean, for those who haven't opened up yet, you know, this is a very um, unique situation we find ourselves in where the customers are so excited to get back into venue. Mm -hmm. um, they're incredibly understanding. Um, um, that's why communication is so important, communication with the staff and the customers, so they know what the playing field is, but they're very understanding. Um, we've, we have guests who stand in queues in bar, to get into the bars. You know, they'll stand in the queue for three hours to get in. And when they get to the front of the queue, they're in such a fantastic mood <laughs> and they're so excited to get in. So there's this incredible, incredibly positive energy amongst mm. all our guests. Um, and the staff are so excited to be back at work. Um, and the employer is so excited to have <laughs> both staff um, back at work and the customers in our venues. So there's this very positive, wonderful energy, um, which I think has made the process extremely fluid. Um, we haven't had uh, any issues, touch wood. Um, you know, we, we're getting uh, all the restaurants, we're doing uh, pre-booking, um, and we're also doing prepayment as well mm -hmm. um, because, you know, space is more valuable than ever. Mm. Um, and again, uh, the customer's been very understanding around that and yeah. we've had very little pushback. Um, I was going to say there's no pushback to the prepayment. That's very great. Minimal, minimal. Um, That's fantastic. Everyone, I think, has a greater appreciation for, for the industry, um, mm -hmm. um, not only ourselves and our staff, but, but the guests as well. So it is a very unique situation. Um, um, and I think that's why communication is very important. Uh, you need to have a very strong uh, COVID safe plan um, that is clear and evident to the staff so that they know what the situation is. And then that makes the customer feel comfortable and safe. And if the customer feels safe in your environment, then it, it, it's going to work. And the sooner we get, you know, the sooner we prove this can work, the sooner the, the restrictions are going to be lifted. Mm. So it's in all of our interest to get this right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm being a big ambassador of pushing the COVID safe app um, mm -hmm. to both staff and our customers. I mean, it's not mandatory and, and it's certainly not compulsory, but it is a wonderful way of, of getting the details so that if something does mm. go wrong, you know, the, the individuals that have come in contact um, with someone with COVID-19 can be contacted immediately. And it's about containing uh, the virus if there is another outbreak. Mm. Well, that's, that's really heartwarming to hear, Justin, as you know, yeah, we're, we're one step behind you in terms of our restrictions. Um, and you've opened around 30 of your 70 outlets, is that right? Oh, I, think it's, I think it's more than that. We've, okay. uh, apart from a few, we've, we've pretty much opened um, everything. Um, 
we did a, a somewhat staggered approach uh, just because of the sheer scale of the job to mm -hmm. get venues open again. Mm -hmm. um, but very few remain unopened. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, you know, I think, well, uh, you know, we have a role to play. We've got fantastic support from the government with the JobKeeper. Yeah. Um, we've, we're very fortunate here in New South Wales to have numbers of, you know, up to 50 per room, which does make mm. it a lot more viable. Yeah. And does result in venues being able to open and, mm. and financially viable, which means a lot more employment. Mm. So I think it's our responsibility in New South Wales to open as much as we can, mm. you know, to, to support the government's uh, move to have 50 instead of the 20. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've made a certain effort to open pretty much everything with the exception okay. of very yeah. few. And you, you've touched on a few of the points, but can you walk us through what the Maryvale experience entails as, as, a, as a customer? Like I'm walking into a venue, what are some of the specific um, measures you've taken in terms to be COVID safe? Um, well, it's all the ones that Wes listed. You know, we have someone, whether it's a bar or a restaurant, we take the... Uh, we take your details at the table. Um, um, with a bar, we take it at the point of point of entry. I mean, all the venues only have one point of entry now, so that, that can be controlled. Um, we have a host uh, at the front, which also helps explain to the customer what, what the process is going to be. Mm -hmm. So it, that added uh, level of contact at the beginning helps with the whole process because there's also an information point. Um, it is not that different to the, the old normal, to be honest, um, walking into venues, apart from the spacing, um, because there's this added benefit where everyone is so excited, so the energy levels are heightened. So mm -hmm. there is this wonderful energy anyway, and we have the you know, capacity of 50, so it does make for a, 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 a mm -hmm. it fills the room much better than say 20. So right. isn't that different? Um, um, I know you guys are only going into the 20, but mm. you, you'll be at 50 very soon. And it, it isn't that different. You're getting pre-bookings. Um, and I think the pre-payment is, is really important for, as an industry mm -hmm. to do that because every seat is so valuable mm -hmm. um, to, to the business and also to our suppliers to guarantee yeah. you know, the, um, purchasing from our suppliers. Mm -hmm. So you've got this commitment from the guests where they're coming to have a great time. They've already pre-paid to a certain amount. Um, mm. it isn't that different. That, you know, yeah. this point of resistance of getting the details, turn it into a positive. It's a great mm. way to explain the situation and how safe your venue is. So it makes them feel comfortable. And then the nights, it's business as usual. Yeah. And so with the prepayment, so it's a set menu? They're all set menus? No, 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 no it's normal. No. It's, it's just a minimum payment. Right, okay, cool. Great, so it, okay. It's different yeah. for each venue. Right. Uh, but it, it's more of a, a guaranteed... Um, yeah, yeah, and and Jerry, how how it how is your experience? It, it, it does it does it does it feel very similar to what Justin? Um, oh look, I think I'm on the other end where Justin is. Justin is at the end where everybody wants to go to the the, the, the Maravale venues. Um, my question is, uh, we were restricted to six per table, um, and if, if New South Wales has that restriction, and we're also restricted to where. Uh, so these are questions for Justin. Um, where uh, if you go into a bar or a, a pub, you have to have a main meal. You can't just come in and have a snack. Uh, I'm not sure if New South Wales has the same restrictions because we have those and it's a little bit um, uh, more of a push for us customers in the door for a pub or for our bar, a beer hall. We don't have a few beers. Um, we have, um, you know, our, our suburban stores are doing uh, quite well. A lot of people in the suburbs mm -hmm. are coming out more. They're, they're, they're eagerly coming out and eating and, and nearly back to normal. Where, where is it still a um, uh, work from home, if you can, is still very quiet and, and, and very ghost town-like-esque. Um, that's why a lot of venues in the city, I don't believe, have opened as yet because we're, we're waiting to see what will happen. We're waiting to move from the, the 20 to the 50 and then when the 20 to the 50 will change, will then the restriction of six per table change and will the restriction of can I just come in for a beer um, rather than coming, I have to have, say, a main meal to eat, um, mm. to, to have a drink. So, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit more difficult, I think, um, with the restrictions that we've got with that 
Um, we can't have big tables. I've, I've had a lot of bookings and they don't want to, and it's the same thing. I don't want to sit apart. I want to sit in one table. So we're just trying to work people out to understand our restrictions and, and, and our capability, yeah. what we can work around. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the question of how many meals do I have to have, to how many beers I can have in our beer yeah. hall. Right. You know, in the outer so, suburbs, mm. some people that are um, like, I don't want to give you my details. Mm. I don't want to share my details. It's like, well, you either have to have the app or share the details. I think so. Therefore, I feel like I'm on the opposite spectrum to where Justin is, where people are dying to get to his venues. I'm dying to get to his venues. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying to go to Sydney to go to his venues. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, um, I think we're on the other end because we're more casual dining and, 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 um, and I don't want to, it's a bit more sort of an Asian, so therefore they feel they can push us over and go, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Mm. Whereas actually I can't, I, I, I don't want the fine and you don't want the fine, you know? Yeah. So they're the kinds yeah. of issues that we're getting back from people. I want to have a yeah. bigger table. Uh, I want to, you know, sit here or I don't want to give you my details. Yeah. And, and well, have me be, have, or how many glasses of wine can I have if I order one main meal and, and those kinds of things that we're trying to... Um, work through and, and work through. Get through. Well, it's great to hear both experiences, absolutely. We've had a question from the audience whether you're both running reduced menus. Yes. You are, Jerry. yeah. Yes, so uh, we're, we're phenomenal usually has a fairly large menu. We've taken out the classics and the favourites mm -hmm. and along with that and uh, same with uh, Biho and Anam. They normally have quite... Mm -hmm. Biho normally has quite a, a larger menu. Mm -hmm. um, but everything's at a reduced menu at the moment for us. And Justin, in your venues in Sydney? No, no, we're running at, at full menu. Um, a lot of the venues have had to do a, a complete new menu, obviously, because we've, we're in a different season. Mm -hmm. um, we also use the, the downtime as a bit of an R&D um, process mm -hmm. um, into, into the new menu because we knew we'd have to, have to hit the ground running. Um, so almost quite the opposite. We're, we're, we're about, you know, really surprise and delight and, and giving it everything we can to give the customer the best experience because I think these are me memorable, memorable times um, and we want to make it as special as possible for the customer. And, um, yeah. we're, we're, you know, we, we unfortunately, well, fortunately for us, but unfortunately for you guys, mm. that, you know, our, we have the capacity of 10 per table. Uh, we don't have the limitations of six. Um, and, and we went through the previous step to this was a capacity of 10 people. So mm. our first step was 10 people capacity for the entire venue, which was a whole different ball game. So right. moving from 10 to 50 is like life changing experience. <laughs> for, you know? Yeah. So just a matter of timing. And it feels like, like you're saying, there's been some really positive indicators in the last couple of days with New Zealand and, and talk in the sporting arena of, of, you know, things opening up. Whereas, um, just coming back to Victoria for a moment, you know, the, the 20 person capacity has been, you know, is, is the challenge for everyone. Um, I understand from our discussions that the RCA is lobbying for change. Um, can you talk us through a little bit what's been put up or? So ultimately we've been working with the Andrews government on um, his planned rollout, which is uh, I believe the 22nd uh, to go to 50. Again, that does depend upon community transmission, which uh, has been very low, uh, so and approaching statistically zero. So if that holds, uh, I believe between now and then, um, there's a good chance that the next round of reopenings will happen, and then we'll be on par with mm -hmm. uh, New South Wales. Uh, and hopefully, there is a potential that we might, you know, it might skip some numbers and uh, and move closer than to the rest of the country, which you know in in other states, the restrictions have been nearly lifted, uh, and some states mm. are, are quite a bit more than uh, the 20 mm. in Victoria, which did have the most community transmission, so we certainly understand. Uh, in addition, there's uh, lots of conversations in every state around, around wedding receptions, uh, mm -hmm. which are different than uh, typical restaurant or uh, hotel operations. Uh, you behave differently in those type of uh, food and beverage events. So we're working very closely with the Victorian uh, as well as the other states mm. governments on getting uh, weddings uh, mm. receptions to some reasonable numbers quicker. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And I guess, of course, the most difficult piece for everyone is, of course, the uncertainty. And just, I know you've already spoken publicly about the need for a clear framework on the go forward. Um, do either yourself or Wes have any further insight into what the, sort of the longer term framework might look like? Or we, you know, pretty much what we see in the media is, is as it is, it's, we're just waiting, um, it's a bit of a waiting game in terms of um, the, the position we're in? So I'll start uh, with, um, uh, the government initially said one per four was in for a while. I don't think anyone expected uh, in February and March that we would be at statistically zero cases on the 10th of June. Uh, mm. I think that there's a chance that overnight tonight we will have zero cases around the country. I don't think that that was planned that way. Uh, yesterday, ironically, globally, was the highest infection count of any day before. And so for Australia, for New Zealand to be at statistically zero, that's a feat that is attributed directly to the social distancing and the lockdowns that were put in place. So you know, we firmly believe that that's why. So in reopening, um, you know, ultimately New Zealand has reopened with no social distancing, just no international tourism. I, I would expect that you know, within the coming months, I wouldn't say weeks, but I would expect within the coming months that the expectation from businesses in Australia is if we're at statistical zero and it's been a cycle, three weeks to a month, we should be uh, rolling back social distancing, uh, but also remaining COVID safe. Right? There's nothing wrong with everyone having the COVID safe app. There's nothing wrong with uh, social distancing uh, at certain events and certain in certain behaviors. Uh, for mm -hmm. the safety of everyone. I think, you know, this is the, the lightest flu season. This is the lightest cold season. You know, there's so many uh, things that have changed because of our behaviors. Uh, so it's important that you know, we're going to continue lobbying, that as soon as the health authorities believe that it is safe, that businesses are opened as fast after that as possible. Mm -hmm. Justin, is there anything that you'd like to add? Well, uh... Just mirroring what, what Wes um, said, you know, uh, as a nation, we've done an incredible job at containing this. I think the government's done a phenomenal job. Um, and, and obviously because of all the, um, the Australians have been so well behaved um, compared to what's going on around the world, we have, you know, come to a point of containment. And I know that the federal government uh, and I know that New South Wales government uh, their priority is, is getting the economy back up and running. Um, and I know that also with, within the health organisation, they, although their number one priority is obviously health, uh, the health and safety, they too understand that the economy needs to be up and running again. So mm -hmm. we're all on the same page. Uh, it's certainly not like we're, we're combating the, the authorities by any means. Um, and as soon as the indications allow it, permit it, they will be relaxing the restrictions more and more. So the better job we do at this and the better we do the job we do at containing it and also not just containing it, but as, as we've been talking about this COVID safe app, that if there is an outbreak that we can contain it um, mm -hmm. immediately. And that is as important as getting these zero figures, the ability to contain it, because it's all about the health system being able to cope with any spike in, in cases. Mm. So we're on the right track. Don't abuse the, the restrictions because they will be lifted um, very quickly, I think, you know, we've moved at such an incredible rate. I never anticipated us to be in this, mm. this position yeah. by, you know, beginning of June. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's going to have, it's happening very quickly. And the good thing is that the government is giving us forward notice mm -hmm. and the ability to plan your openings because reopening a venue is mm. incredibly difficult. It is not the flick yeah. of a switch. Um, mm. Don't underestimate uh, the amount of planning and work required. So the, the, the greater time we get to plan the opening, the mm. smoother your openings are going to be. Yeah. Well, actually, first, I just yeah. want to touch, sorry, just with a yeah. question before about the reduced menu. Yes. Um, I, I should relate that to experience. When we were doing the 10 people, mm -hmm. uh, we were operating under a reduced menu, um, reduced yeah. mindless, reduced menu. Um, mm -hmm. But it was almost too reduced. And uh, we were about to open Mr. Wong's. And it was our first day of trade to our huge capacity of 10 people. And I, was, <laughs> I was in venue, 
15, it was literally 15 minutes before we opened at midday. And I went up to the kitchen. And I said, so what amazing dishes have you got on? They said, we don't have any. We're doing our limited takeaway menu. I said, no, we've got these customers that are dying to come here. And I said, have you got live seafood? Have you got lobsters and crab and, and abalone and pippies? They said, no, we don't have any of that. And it just so happened that our seafood supplier walked into the venue with our delivery for that lunch. And I said, have you got any live produce in your <laughs> truck? And he said, no, but I, I'm, it's 15 minutes away. So I rang um, our guests <laughs> who were about to come in. And I said, do you want lobster, or crab, pippies or abalone? They said, we'll take the lot. So, you know, well, the customers want it. And, you know, we sold out, we sold an incredible amount of lobsters just for that lunch service and the dinner service and then on. So, People want to come and celebrate. So don't cut yourself short. Right. Give them something special and they, and they will spend yeah. and they want to have a great time. So, so, you know, you obviously have to watch, watch your costs, but you do have the benefit of JobKeeper. Yeah. Don't, cut, don't cut yourself too short. And, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's why you're one of the giants of the Australian hospitality trade, Justin. Uh, you're, you're on the tools. Yeah. <laughs> Hands-on CEO. I love it. Um, and further to what we were talking about reopening uh, venues, um, Justin, you've, you've already mentioned that you've virtually reopened most of your venues. What are the key indicators, and, and we're still, we still have a bit more of a staggered approach here in Victoria. There are still are a lot of venues that have not opened. What are the key um, indicators you were looking for in terms of pre-opening the venues? How do you make that decision? Oh, or whether to open a venue? Mm, mm. Well, when it was at capacity of 10, it was a very, very different criteria to the 50. Um, and as I said before, with the capacity of 50 per room, I think it was our uh, responsibility to open as many venues as we can to support jobs, um, to support the economy and to support the government's decision to do the 50. So it was basically, I said, I want to open everything. You have to give me a very good reason why we shouldn't open it. Um, um, but you know, out the suburban venues um, had a much quicker uptake than the CBD. Obviously, mm -hmm. our CBD is very different to your CBD. Your CBD is very interconnected to to the suburbs. Ours is not. Um, but the suburban areas had a much greater uplift uh, mm -hmm. or immediate impact. We're starting to see the city filling up again now. This week is the first indication of of a spike in um, numbers in the city, not of COVID yeah. cases of actual um, um, people moving around the city. But for me, it was, let's open everything we can to give as much employment and also to create momentum. Because right. if you keep the venue shut, you're not going to be busy and you're not going to create excitement. So yeah. you've got to be open to get this place, to get the, the country right. going again. So yeah. I think, you know, open up, make mm. it work. And, and also... It, it, it's such a big job to open. You, you, it's, not, you, it's not going to happen overnight. Mm. So start planning now, regardless of whether it's 20 mm. or 50 in the future. You need to plan your opening now. Mm. You need to get the staff back. A lot of the staff won't be around as well. We, you know, mm. staff, we, had, we had a lot of staff that had to leave the country and can't come back. Um, you know, make, just making sure your extraction's working, uh, your equipment is working, uh, your air conditioning units are working. All this stuff mm. takes time and don't, don't mm. think you're going to walk in and open up. You've got to mm. assume that it's, you're opening the venue for the first time. Not right. a reopening, it's a first opening because that's how, I mean, it was quite, and even the staff, because they've been in, in you know, lockdown mode, they're not up to speed. You know, they're used to being in high, high, high turnover, high speed, their adrenaline's pumping, all that stopped. So it's back mm. to grassroots now, training, systems, a lot of the systems mm. will be forgotten. Um, you need mm. new training. So there's a lot to do. So start planning now because the 20 um, that, that you've got now will be 50 before you know it, which will be 100 before you know it. So, yeah. so uh, my recommendation is open up. And you've got that wonderful JobKeeper support, which is mm. you know, just a fantastic, mm. fantastic mm. thing. Well, there's some great pieces of advice in there. Thank you, Justin. And Jerry, this is very much the process that you're exactly going through at the moment as you're trying to um, work out when you'll open an arm in the city and the other two phonom venues. How are you approaching that decision-making process? How's it working for you? 
again, I think I feel I'm on the opposite side of where Justin <laughs> <laughs> um, where, um, you know, the, the suburbs, Justin is right, the suburbs have, have embraced the opening of Beer Hoy out, uh, out at the Glen Waverley. Mm -hmm. um, people are coming back to the shopping centre, people are coming back to doing the grocery shopping. Um, and with the city, we're just being a little bit more cautious of how we reopen it, as uh, there's not a lot of people here. Uh, three of our phenom stores are under in a shopping one's in a shopping centre and two are under office towers and as you know all office towers have like a 20 percent capacity at the moment um, that, that staff are working from so uh, we chose one store to start opening in our Collins Street store um, because we had a lot of office towers nearby so it just opened a, a lot more up for us um, whereas the other store I mean I've been walking in and out of our shopping centres and everything with other two stores are still quiet. There's still nobody, nobody's coming to the city. Um, mm -hmm. Without all the office workers in the city, there's no one coming to the city um, to do shopping or to spend money mm -hmm. to work even. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we've been very careful. We've done, we've been doing takeaway from uh, Collins Street, our Fernom Collins Street store mm -hmm. and takeaway from, from Annam. Um, we're looking at opening next week because we feel the city's uh, got a bit more of a lift uh, and if we open towards the end of next week or be from the 20 moving into the 50 capacity mm -hmm. so it'll be a um, very nice uh, easy transition into that mm -hmm. um, and you know we're looking at how and when the government will say come back to the city to work uh, right. I think started coming back to the city to work mm -hmm. so there'll be a lot more people uh, out and about um mm -hmm. you know Anthea in Melbourne I'm standing at the top end of Collins Street and yeah. I would you know shoot someone and no one would know yeah where it's really quiet yeah so busy and so much going mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. um now there's just where so for us I think we're a little bit more more cautious, um, whereas Justin's got a lot of job keeper, a lot of um, Australian residents, perhaps, where a lot of our venues in the city um, are international students, international workers, working holiday visas. We don't have job keeper, so mm -hmm. from all our firm stores, I only have two people in job keeper, right? Um, and they're working at the Collins Street store, and then mm -hmm. we started bringing some of our international our students and staff, uh, and out of our own pocket to start you know, giving them some shoes because we want to make sure, like Justin said, we want to make sure that they're there. We've spent the mm -hmm. time and the, the, the effort and the money and, and um, in training them and, and give and the experience they have that we could not get back very quickly. So we want those staff to come back. Yeah. Um, we're sharing very small little amount of shifts that we have to as many people mm -hmm. as we can. Because yeah. we Eric, just, just to uh, clarify, I mean, the job keeper, we, we have, uh, it's, it's certainly not a majority um, that's um, JobKeeper eligible. But what it does, it helps subsidise those who aren't JobKeeper eligible. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And that's why we brought back two. Mm. So I had a staff of about 60 people, two were in charge of the JobKeeper. And then we've brought other staff back to um, fill the shifts, so they're all rotating shifts. And we're just looking mm. at, at what stage now is the next step for us to um, open the other venues. The other phenoms and I'm really hoping you know by the end of June that we can all go back to the office and we can all come back to yeah. the city and that will invigorate the city again because at and the that that would be yeah that that would be the catalyst for you yeah, yeah. and I think that's for a lot of people in the CBD as well I think they're all waiting right. a lot of people yeah. see uh, the capacity increase for one and uh, more people coming because yeah. without having to work in the city or having to do any work in the city uh, there's no real reason to come to the city at the moment. Mm, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been some... T thank you. Um, we've touched on JobKeeper already, um, and, you know, it has been a lifeline for many businesses. Uh, of course, it's going to come off um, in September. Well, that's the plan at the moment. Um, and there are many concerns around how, you know, what the impact of this will be. Les, uh, Les... Wes, <laughs> Wes, what's your feeling around job the job keeper coming off, and how are we going to manage this? Well, um, we are lobbying the federal government, uh, along with many of the other peak bodies uh, associated with hospitality, 
uh, for the job keeper to taper off rather than just end uh, right. for accommodation and food service and for the tourism transport uh, so that the industries that are the most affected by the government regulation. So as long as there is one before, as long as there are caps, as long as state borders are closed and as long as the international borders are closed, uh, those industries will be down 25 to 50% period. Uh, just think about how many tourists come to Melbourne or come to Sydney or any capital city in Australia um, from overseas. They're not here. They're not going to be here potentially until 2021. Mm. And you may say, oh, well, I wasn't affected by international tourists. You might have been and not known it because many of your bookings were because people couldn't get into other restaurants. And so you had lots of bookings because, because of capacity constraints. Now with no capacity constraints, you might find that the bookings get spread out amongst all of the businesses rather than, than pushing uh, customers to, to uh, certain businesses because of, of the tourism. So that's a main key driver of why we're lobbying for JobKeeper to uh, at least go until 31 December, if not 30 March, okay. uh, for the most affected industries. Uh, mm -hmm. We're lobbying the government to changes to FBT uh, to the deductibility of business meals, which will lead to the long lunches, um, which are very productive from a business point of view. We never could quite understand why you could deduct a business meal if a restaurant delivered the meal to your office and you had it in your boardroom, but you couldn't deduct it if the boardroom went to the, uh, went to the restaurant. It, it doesn't really make sense to us. Uh, so we're, we're lobbying that, as well as changes to GST and CGT. Uh, GST potentially adding it to your bill, like many other industries do, mm -hmm. uh, and the CGT uh, being waived for any small business that finds themselves having to sell uh, post the stimulus packages, uh, post 28 mm -hmm. September, uh, where they may have accrued a lot of personal debt uh, mm -hmm. to keep their business running through COVID crisis, and then find themselves selling and and hit with a huge uh, capital gains tax bill. Mm. So these are all things we're lobbying for. Okay, well, so welcome news, I'm sure, for many people that are, that are listening in. Um, Justin, how, what are your thoughts around this and how, how have you started planning your go forward when JobKeeper comes off in terms of yeah, business planning across Maryvale? Well, I mean, we're going ahead on the, the basis that, I mean, Again, we don't have a crystal ball. Um, you know, we do look at, we're looking more at the short term than the long term. Um, however, given, you know, the indications of, of where we're at, by the time JobKeeper comes off, we should be in a, a position where it's, which is sustainable. But of course, the longer the JobKeeper goes, the better. Mm. Um, but, you, you know, it, it, we, we just have to manage our business around the costs that we experience at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and it's more, more than ever managing your wages, uh, even under JobKeeper, is more crucial than ever. And and that's why, with especially with the limited numbers, you know, the prepayment is is a great assistance because mm -hmm. if you lose a table of five or a table of ten, whether you're under fifty capacity or twenty, it can destroy your entire model. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the prepayment is a, is a, is a very good thing to for. For, for the industry um, mm -hmm. while we move through this. But, mm -hmm. you know, we're hoping by the time we get to, and the government has been, you know, very supportive of the industry and also they realise how important this industry is uh, to getting the economy um, back up and running. Um, mm -hmm. And as Wes touched on, things like FBT, which is just the greatest disincentive tax for corporates, mm -hmm. uh, for companies and corporations to use hospitality. I mean, these mm. things are a fantastic opportunity for these, you know, mm. taxes to be removed. There should be, there should be a tax deduction, it should be encouraged, <laughs> not, not, a, not a tax penalty. It's actually a double tax penalty. Um, so I think, you know, Wes is well, well, well ahead of the game um, and doing some fantastic things. Um, and now is the time to, to lobby for reform and change because the industry needs it um, and, and more so ever than now. Mm. Is there anything that pe members, people watching um, can do to help with the lobbying process? Is there anything? Uh, well, um, 
first off, uh, d don't uh, be a standout. Don't say you're going to do something that's illegal. It's very important that businesses uh, follow the, the health regulations and, and follow their industry associations. Look, we're just looking out for all businesses uh, in the accommodation and food services uh, ANZAC code and, and uh, as us in a wheel of tourism. Uh, we, are, we have direct lines of communication with the federal government, with the premiers, and we're literally having all the conversations that you think that we should be having. We're mm -hmm. having all those conversations. And mm -hmm. it really is about behavior of your business mm -hmm. and what you do in your business. So if you want to help us as individual businesses, look, join your industry association, you know, restaurant and catering or clubs or AHA or depending upon you know, where, where you fit into the, into the hospitality uh, universe, uh, what you think works best for you, you have to be represented by an industry association you know, because otherwise you're out there floating on your own and, and you may or may not understand uh, how the regulations apply to you. And the worst thing that can happen is that you, you get a fine and you know, your, your venue gets closed down for a period of time or that you have a COVID outbreak uh, because you weren't COVID safe because you just didn't know. So, you know, it's, it's just about learning, uh, getting the knowledge you need, and then applying that and finding out that it's very inexpensive to be COVID safe. Uh, short of hand sanitizer, you know, you can have a piece of paper at your front door that, to sign people in. Like it's, if you go through the mandatory list, it really has zero cost if you wanted to have zero cost. Mm -hmm. If you want to be super technological, you can incur some costs. Uh, I think I walked into a restaurant early on in Queensland uh, he spent $700 being COVID safe and he was as COVID safe as you could be uh, with you know, unique uh, floor markers and QSR, QR codes on the tables for the menu and hand sanitizer stations all around and temperature checks at the front door. Again, it, was, it, it is very low cost to be COVID safe, but you could not afford being the start of a pandemic uh, or of a, of a cluster. Yeah, okay. Um, there's been a lot of talk of pivoting and survival, uh, particularly before we started opening up venues. Um, and I know where's your predicting, and, and part of that, of course, has been delivery and takeaway services. Where's your you're predicting that um, even as venues start to open, that that will those numbers will increase from eight percent to between twenty and twenty five percent of the market as we sort of transition out of lockdown. Um, if there's a silver lining. Um, for you, Justin, it might have been the birth of Maryvale at Home, which is a really wonderful initiative. Would you mind sharing with us a little bit about that program and, and how it came to be? Um, yes, silver lining. <laughs> um, a wonderful way of putting it. Or Bain, Bain of your life, maybe. <laughs> I won't be retiring on it. Um, it was, um, you know, everything moves so quickly um, from you know, first of all, we had the restrictions on trade, which were put in place. So, you know, our immediate reaction to that was, how do we keep these our businesses open and employed and employing people with these restrictions? So it was, you know, we turned our mind to um, uh, employee and salary support. But then within a couple of days, uh, we had full shutdown. And when you come into full shutdown mode, it's like, okay, well, how do I keep the business afloat and how do I maintain employment of as many people as possible because JobKeeper didn't exist at that point. Mm -hmm. um, it was job seeker only. Um, so we went into um, crisis mode. Um, how do we look after our staff priority? How do we get revenue coming into the business because our bills didn't certainly didn't stop. Um, and you know, one of the, one of the benefits that came out of that is, um, giving the Maryvale or creating the Maryvale experience and bringing it to people's homes, which is obviously the only way that people could, could uh, experience um, um, uh, uh, food from, from, our, from our industry. Um, so, you know, I guess in, in an unusual way, we were fortunate that we had time on, you know, uh, available to divert our attention to creating, you know, what we feel is our, our Maryvale experience and mm. bring it into people's homes under these, you know, uh, crazy times so we had the talent available i mean under the normal mm. trading our, our exec chefs and, and even ourselves don't have the the resources and the time um to to dedicate to this um and i think we did something 
pretty wonderful. We, we turned it around incredibly quickly. I mean, it, it's not just a food and beverage operation. It, it's actually a logistics um, mm. and incredibly complex logistical um, um, business. Um, and you know, I think within our, our corporation, we created some magic because we turned it around so quickly mm. and we still maintained employment of you know, a couple of hundred people to pull this off. And it was a resounding um, um, result. It was, mm -hmm. people loved it. Um, we maintained loyalty from our customers. Um, you know, we, we did the, the experience at home, but we introduced the um, playlists, um, um, little surprise and delights in the, yeah. in the delivery, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a wonderful project um, mm -hmm. to take on. Um, incredibly steep learning curve, mm -hmm. um, but very rewarding at the end. We also turned them obviously to takeaway, mm. which you know it's it, w when you're operating um, hospitality business, which is uh, dine in predominantly, mm. to then shift to takeaway is is no easy feat. I mean, it is a, it is a very different operation, as I'm sure many many people um, have mm -hmm. have discovered. Um, but just you know, turning Mr. Wong's or or Toddy's into a takeaway machine was again a, a very um, interesting process and, and something we turned around pretty quick and, mm -hmm. and pretty satisfying. But uh, you know, as these numbers um, uh, um, get lifted and our capacities increase, you know, to go back into the dine-in model is is our priority. Yeah. And you, you can't. I don't believe you can run both because our venues are set up and designed for in-house in-house dining mm -hmm. and. You know, takeaways, it's a very different thing, the packaging and mm. the timing and the allotments and the slots. Mm -hmm. And so, oh. you know, I think the takeaway was a, a, an immediate, how do we maintain employment? How do we keep get some revenue coming in? Um, but I think it, 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 the takeaway won't continue once we get back to normality. Okay. But Maribel at home will definitely, and we're hoping to bring it down to uh, Melbourne as well. Well, I was about to ask you that very I'll send, thing. I'll send some packages down to you, Anthony. Uh. <laughs> So the rumours are true, it will be crossing the border into Melbourne? Well, we hope so. We're, again, we're just working out the logistics around the transport, okay. et cetera, but, but it, it's, it's something we would love to do. Right. Uh, and, you and heard we really it here first. It. What's that? You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. cha challenging times can, can create some, some right. wonderful things as well. Right. And Thank you. That's that's really interesting. And Jerry, you um, before you closed your doors, you were doing takeaway out of Anam. Is that something that you might consider when you when you um, open up? Um, um, look, it's something we definitely will consider and, and, and thinking about. But like Justin said, doing takeaway for food like Anam and, and Justin's venue, it's very difficult to move. Very uh, difficult to maintain the integrity of the food when it arrives to the customer. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, someone like Fernam and Beer Ho, their, their food is simple, it's straightforward, it's it's uh, quick and easy to, to, to make and to, to send to eat. But whereas um, Anam's a little bit more intricate and we don't know we can represent it well in takeaway. So that's something we're working on. Uh, we've been working, trialling out dishes uh, and using this time as uh, um, R&D as well, like Justin's team have been doing. Um, so it'd be um, something we'd really consider, which we would have never yeah. done in the past. Yeah, okay, cool. Well, thank you. We have a couple of questions from the audience. We're very quickly running out of time. Um, it's a wonderful conversation. First question from the audience is, when do you think the rule of no drink without food will be lifted? I'm not sure who would be the best person to answer this. Maybe oh, Wes? We, we don't know uh, that in New South Wales. No, so it's... Uh, oh, look, right, okay. that, we, we can't control what the Andrews government decides for Victoria. We certainly are, are lobbying um, towards uh, more reasonable uh, outcomes. But again, that will be entirely up to the government. And we'll hear more about that as it gets closer to, um, mm -hmm. to uh, stage two for the Victorian government. All right. Okay. Another question. I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this one. But can you use patron details that are collected for tracking and tracing for marketing purposes? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> no. Every 28 nice. days. So Absolutely you, not. <laughs> you, yeah. so that's why it's sometimes better to use the apps because then you're yeah. not you're interested. Um, you know, certainly uh, that, that's spam at, at the highest order of spam. The, yeah, the, list supposed to be, the lists are legally supposed to be destroyed every 28 days. 
So, mm -hmm. so basically, you're not to about, <laughs> No, 17 days from now, you should be throwing away your sheets from, right. uh, from last Monday. So it's, it's very important. Good, good to know. Well, look, we're, we are running out of time. How about we wrap this up with our key takeaways? Um, Justin, what would be the single biggest learning? You have shared many, many nuggets of wonderful information so far, but what would be the single thing that you would share with your Victorian friends on the reopening period? Um, I think I've sort of touched on it throughout the, the chat, but <coughs> um, don't underestimate the, the amount of work and preparation that's required to reopen your venue. Um, it, it, it's not the flick of a switch by any means. So preparation is the number one priority in getting your venue back open. And that's everything from equipment to staffing, to suppliers, to menus, to everything. Preparation, preparation, preparation. It's so important. And communication and clarity. Communication and clarity with your staff is paramount and with the customers because they have to feel safe as well and they need to understand what, what they're in for. Um, and, and that's everything from the booking process to the experience in venue. So preparation and communication and assume, um, uh, uh, don't assume anything's going to happen. You have to make, make it happen. I mean, we, even just as simple as we, we closed our venues in summer and we opened in winter. Yet the first day that we opened was like a freezing cold it was Melbourne weather day and I went into one of our largest venues and all the windows and doors were open because that's right. where they left off. So it's, it's really, you've got to get the wheels back in motion and it's not, it's not instantaneous. So training, communication, preparation, so vital, so vital. And give the customer the best experience they can possibly have. What a, that's a, a wonderful piece of advice and don't assume anything. I'm taking that one with me as well. Um, Wes, would you like to add to that? What would be the biggest, biggest, thing you, biggest piece of information you've learnt from touring the country? Pivot, pivot, pivot. It is not over. So restrictions will be in place on international travel potentially into 2021 because the rest of the world is not COVID free. So you know, I, I know there's a lot of pressure and a lot of, uh, a lot of push to reopen international borders, but we need to plan for the worst and hope for the best. So if you are reopening your business for the first time at 50 uh, and you haven't begun to pivot to different lines of business, you need to. So mm -hmm. you know, this is a great opportunity for you to showcase your service and your brand and your food quality in different ways. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's not always easy. Uh, change is never easy. However, we are going to be in COVID land for a while and we need, to, we need to live there. We need to become comfortable with those kinds of changes. So pivot, pivot, pivot. Okay, thank you. And Jerry, would you like to add to the conversation? Oh, look, Biggest I, learning. My, um, I think what Justin said, communication is crucial to the staff, um, especially we have a lot of international students working with us and international um, visa holders with us so we've had to communicate with them the whole time their rights and what we're entitled and how we can help them and how we as a business can work together uh, through this time um you know um financially we're not amazing but um we've, we're trying to feed them make sure that they're okay and and so that you know um they're being looked after because they're so far from home um and change um pivot, like Where's the saying pivot, 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 mm -hmm. but we're at the point now where we want to control that pivot. Um, right. We want to be told how quickly we have to open or how quickly we have to mm -hmm. close and in what capacity and whatever. We're trying to take that control back. Um, right. How and when we can open and how that will benefit the business uh, and how that will benefit the staff and not just we've got to do this now because it's this mm -hmm. and we've got to do this. It's 10, it's four square metres. This Going into lockdown, I felt like a headless chalk running, 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 doing takeaway, changing the business model, changing the business and losing my brand, I felt. So we're right. taking control back. So have control, mm -hmm. having control of my business again. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I've really enjoyed out of this is I've had family time, family right. life balance. I've really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, we went from opening a venue in, November, in August, another venue in November, 
then into Christmas and then into this, the, the beginning of the pandemic. We felt it out in the suburbs in January. Um, that really affected our business and our trade and uh, mm -hmm. out there. And then it started to hit the city. Um, so by the time that everybody was getting ready for the lockdown and the four meetings and the social dishes thing, we were already suffering a month and a half mm -hmm. before that. We were already losing from a month, two months before that. Right. So we were getting ourselves prepared in that suburb, yeah. out of suburbs for this. Yeah. But the best part is is the work life balance. I'm not gonna lie, yeah. I really enjoyed it. I really, really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed my son yelling at me and telling me he hates me and throws an apple. <laughs> I could have hated that. <laughs> well, 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 may that continue yeah. as as we open up. Yeah. Um, well, thank you all so much, Justin, Wes, and Jerry. Thank you for being here with us today. On behalf of, of the audience, thank you very much. We'll be we'll have a recording of this to share later, and really appreciate your time. I know how busy the three of you are. Um, thank you all for joining us. We'll be convening another industry forum in the second week of July. Um, hop on to melbournefoodandwine.com.au, um, and we'll be posting information on that very shortly. Um, my name's Anthea lucas Bosha. Thank you again for tuning into Roadmaps to Recovery and good afternoon. Thanks, Anthea. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.